Okay, so this talk's going to be about an interesting fact about finite groups. Well, actually, it's about finite subsets of groups, but you can also frame it in terms of finite groups. And here's what it says. It says that uh, you have a, finite, uh, a group, not necessarily finite, and you have a non-empty finite subset of the group. So non-empty means it has at least one element, and finite means finitely many elements. And the subset has a property that uh, whenever you take two elements in the subset, the product is also in the subset. Okay, so it's closed under multiplication. So, uh, and I've used the word sub-semi-group in the header. Semi-group just means sub a set with an associative binary operation, and if you have a subset of a group which is closed under multiplication, then it's a sub-semi-group. So, that's just another saying it. And what I want to show is that, that if it's non-empty and finite, then it actually is a, a subgroup. Okay? So, so, let's, let's first make a couple of quick observations about this. So, first of all, uh, we do need finiteness here, okay? So can you think of an example of a group and an infinite subset where, where, uh, which is closed under the multiplication but is not a subgroup? Hmm? Yeah? Uh, next one, one. Oh, you want a infinite, infinite group, yeah, and an infinite subset, yeah? It's not too hard, yeah? I don't know. Well, just take the integers. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yeah. What's a subset which is closed under group, integers under addition? Okay, what's a subset which is closed under the group operation but is not a subgroup? Uh, positive integer. Okay. So the, this subset is closed under the group operation, uh, and it's infinite. It's non-empty, but it's infinite, and it's not a subgroup because it doesn't have what? Why is it inverse. not a subgroup? It doesn't have yeah. It doesn't have the identity. It doesn't have inverses. Okay, good. So we do need to use something about finiteness here. Okay. Now, have you seen any finite groups? Uh, yeah. The what group? Trivial. The trivial group. Yeah. Uh, now, but, but this statement is not really very interesting for the trivial group. So, so really, like, we haven't really seen any non-trivial finite groups, at least, uh, some of our viewers may have seen them, but, uh, in the sequence so far, we haven't seen them. We still need want to prove something about, uh, about finiteness. This is actually our first introduction to finiteness. Okay. So, let's see. We want to prove that H is a subgroup. Now, what's the definition of subgroup? Well, it means it's a subset of a group. It has to be closed under the group multiplication. And it has to contain the identity element of the group. And it has to be closed under the inverse operation of the group. Now, there's another definition of subgroup which just is closed under the multiplication. And it has an identity and an inverse of its own. However, uh, we have shown that by now, we have, sh if you watch the videos in sequence, we have shown that the identity and inverse thing in the subgroup are the same as those in the whole group. Right? Mm -hmm. Uh, we use some things about groups. So basically, we just have to show that H contains the identity and the inverse map and is closed under group multiplication. Okay, let's, uh, let's first settle the easy one. So close under multiplication. How do we prove that H is closed under the group multiplication? Uh, is it already? It's already given, right? So this was easy. Right? So this is already given. So we have to prove three things, right? And we have already done one of them. Good. So that's rapid progress, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's do the other two. Well, before we do the other two, let's uh, think a bit about what we have to do. Essentially, we have to use somewhere that edge is non-empty, right? That we use to sort of start by saying there's something in it, and we have to use finiteness. So let's start thinking about what we can do if you have an element of edge. So let's say you have an element x in edge, okay? What can you do with an element x in h? Can you get more stuff in h from x? Yeah. What can you get? x squared. Okay, why? Because Maybe. it's closed and a multiplication. Closed and multiplication, so x times x is in h. Yeah, anything else? x cubed. And so on. And all? x to the All positive powers of x are in h. So, that's all we have so far. We don't yet know that the negative powers are 
of x, sorry, r in h. We don't yet know that x to the 0 is in h. x to the 0 would be the notation for the identity element, right? Uh, I mean, just analogy with the way usually reuse powers. And x to the minus 1 would be the inverse. And if we could show that x to the 0 and x to the minus 1 are in h, we would be done, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't have that. We, we are, our proof only is saying that positive powers are in h. So far, so bad. Okay, or good. Whatever. We've done something. We've got some stuff in h. Now, we have, therefore, the sequence x, x squared, x cubed. All of these are in h. Sequence in h. What do we know about h? The size of h? Finite. So, what can we say in the sequence? Hmm? What can we say? About the sequence. Oh, it must repeat something. There must be some repetition. It, okay, uh, there's actually going to be a lot of repetition because there's only finitely many values there can be. There's sequence, it's an infinite sequence with finitely many values. So there's a lot of repetition. But let's just say there is, there is some repetition somewhere. Okay, so let's say there are two positions, x to the l and x to the k. We have x to the l equals x to the k with k greater than l. Both are positive. Okay, so we've got some repetition. Now what do we do? What can we do with this? Uh, yeah, now we, now, now we can work inside G. I mean, we don't have to remain inside H now. We have an equation, uh, we have an e equality in G. We can operate on this using, you know, manipulate this in G. Yeah, what do we get? You're saying something? Uh, you have to use the inverse. Yeah, you can use the inverse. Yeah, the inverse is, we don't yet know the inverse are in H, but they are in G. You can just do the manipulation in G. So you can multiply both sides by x to the minus k. Well, let's do x to oh, the minus l because l is the smaller one. L. So you get x to the minus l, x to the l is x to the uh, minus l, x to the k. And uh, we, I don't know if you've seen this formula yet, but the exponents, are, the laws of exponents are pretty similar in groups to way to what they are in. With, with numbers and exponents. So, or you can just do it formally. x to the minus is x inverse written l times, x to the l is x written l times. When you multiply, you just get the identity. What happens here? You have x to the k and you have x inverse written l times. The You get some cancellations and get x to the k minus l. So, what I'm saying is the laws of exponents work, but even if you didn't know that, you could just sort of do it out explicitly. Okay? Now, what do we know about k minus l? It's in the sub uh, no, k minus l is, as a number is positive. positive because we are assuming k is the bigger one, right? We just took the bigger one as k and the smaller one as l. So, therefore, p e is in h. Yes, yes, yes. We, we'll, we'll say this a little more. So, so, therefore, e is a positive power of x, right? Mm -hmm. So, so if you let n of x, so I'm, I'm really like saying this n sort of depends on x is all I'm saying, then x to the nx is e and nx is, is a natural number. Okay, let's just write this down in the form of a lemma here. Yeah, it, we'll use it to show that e is an h, but I want to type the lemma a little more generally. So, for any x in h, We showed two things. The first was all positive powers of x are in h. Everything is here, right, on the screen? Okay. All positive powers of x are in h. And what did we use to say that? We just used its close under multiplication. And two. There exists a, a natural number nx. So I, I'm writing nx just to indicate that it depends on x. Okay, so for if I picked a different x, I could get a different thing, such that x to the nx is e. I'm using e to denote the identity element.
of g. Okay, so now how do we show that e is an edge? Hmm? Mm -hmm. We this lemma almost immediately tells us that e is an edge, right? Yeah. How does it do that? Because e is a positive power. Well, you have to say well, power. yeah. That that's the other idea. I just want to be a little more clear here. We have to use that edge is non-empty. So I'll I'll say it a little. More. So since h is non-empty, you can pick some element. Uh, I won't call it x just because just uh, pick uh, some element. So u in h, okay, then uh, set x equals u in the lemma. And we get what? Uh, we get e is a positive power of u. Of u, that's by part two of the lemma, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, by part one, by part two of the lemma, and so. So E is an H by part one. The point is we have to the lemma actually didn't use anything about the about H being non empty. Just said if you have an element, then all its positive powers are there and this is there. So to actually show that the identity is that you have to use the non emptiness. So that's where the non empty comes. Part one. Okay. That's just a little bit. So if you had an empty finite subset, any empty set would be would satisfy this condition, right? Mm. Vacuously. You know what vacuously means? Sort of Trivially, without for no for like a silly reason, but an empty finite subset would not be a subgroup, and this this is what would fail. You cannot pick an element and start reasoning from there. Okay, now the next one. So if you have an element g in H, I want to argue that g inverse is in H. What do you do? Hmm? What? How do you show that if you have an element in H, then its inverse is also in? H. We want to show H is a subgroup, right? Mm -hmm. We shown it on the multiplication. We shown that the identity is in there. Okay, now I want to show that uh, that the inverse of an element in there is also in there. You want to show for each element in H, hmm? there is if there exists another element in H such that their product is E. Yes, exactly. Okay, so again we want to use the same lemma, right? We want to use the the fact that the positive powers are here, right? Let's get back here to the picture. So what we had that x to the nx is e, right? Mm. Or, so we here now g, we will set x equals g in the lemma, right? Mm. I'm just not using the letter x here again just to be clear that sort of, yeah, it, it just sort of uh, keeps the letter the same. So then what will you get? We'll get g to the n of g is e. Okay, now how do you get g inverse in h? Well, so for instance, if g to the 5 were the identity, then what would g inverse be? Negative 5. Oh, no. What, what, so what the real idea is, how can you write g inverse as a positive power of g? That's the question, right? If you can write g inverse as a positive power of g, then, then you would be done, right? Mm -hmm. So, so if, if let's say g to the 5 is the identity, mm -hmm. then g inverse is what positive power of g? Hmm? So, okay, let's say g squared is the identity. Then what's g inverse? g squared is the identity. Hmm? Then g inverse is what? I'm not sure. Okay, let's let's think about so, so so let's we have g to the n of g is the identity, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say we multiply both sides by g inverse. What do we get? What do we get if we multiply both sides by g inverse? E equals to g inverse. So what is what do you what do you the get? The left the left side of the equation is e. 
You said you used to multiply by g inverse. Yeah, but the left side is g to the n of g, right? g to the power of something is e. Uh -huh. So when you multiply by g inverse, what do you get? Okay, that's it. I'm just confused. Okay, so. Okay, good. So, what does this become? You add the exponents, right? And maybe I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused. Do it on a Okay, so what I'm saying is that if, uh, if g to the, if g squared is the identity, what's the inverse of g? What's the number you need to multiply g by to get, what's the element you need to multiply g by to get the identity? Um, just tell me the answer, I don't understand. Well, what number do you need to multiply g by, what thing do you need to multiply g by to get the identity? If g squared is the identity. The inverse of it. Yeah, but what is g inverse? What positive power of g equals g inverse is what I'm asking. Okay. Uh, well, I'll tell you, in this case, g inverse is just g. Right? g inverse is g? Yes, because if g squared is the identity, then if you multiply both sides by g inverse, Now what's g squared times g inverse? g. g, so you get g is g inverse, right? Well, that seems all like numerical mani manipulation. Yeah, it is that, yeah. So, if g to the power of some number, this is just a number, is the identity, how can you get g inverse as a positive power of g? What do you do? Uh, Just n g minus one. Yeah. So what do you do? You multiply by g inverse. That's one way of doing it, right? So you get g to the n g. Uh, g inverse is g inverse. So g to the n g minus one is g inverse. Okay. Another way of thinking of it is that you have g to the n g is identity, right? This is g times g times g n of g times, right? Mm -hmm. So if you just group all of these together, you'll get g times g to the n g minus 1 is the identity. Okay? Okay. So this is, this thing is the inverse of g. Okay. Okay? So, so how do we prove it now? Well, we actually have to make two cases. So the first case is that uh, n g equals 1. Because if n g equals 1, what does that mean? That means g has to be the identity element, right? Because the first power of g itself is the identity. Then what's the inverse of the identity element? G inverse. Yeah, what's the inverse of the identity element for group? The identity. Is the is its own inverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if g if, if n g is one, then g is the ident identity. So g inverse is also the identity equals g, which is therefore in H, right? So suppose n of g is greater than 1, then uh, g to the n of g is the identity implies g to the what power of g is its inverse? n g minus 1. Okay, and now how do you conclude that this is in h? Hmm? Because mg minus 1 is a positive power. Positive, positive number, number. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, which is an h by uh, part 1 of the lemma. Okay, good. So, so now the, the interesting thing is sort of, this, this is a little tricky, right? I mean, this part, the inverse part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So uh, let's just try to understand this a uh, little more clearly, what's happening here. Okay. So here, I have a picture here. So let's say you are, you are in your group, right? You start with the identity element. Okay. And then you say, let's keep multiplying by x. Okay. x is just anything in the group. So, so you start with the identity, you go e times x, then you do x times x, you get x squared, then you do uh, x squared times x, you get x cubed. Okay. Now, finiteness, what's finiteness telling you? Hmm? There is repetition. There is a repetition. So in general, you expect there to be some kind of repetition where some power equals some other power, right? And the first such repetition you have, you, you get this type of cycle thing. And once, once you get back where you were, then after that, it'll just keep tracing like this, right? So you expect a shape. If you, if you make this kind of picture of the powers, you expect a shape like this, right? Mm -hmm. Like what I'm saying is once you have two, a repeated power, then after that, it will keep cycling along the same path, right? Mm -hmm. And this kind of shape is called a row shape. There's a Greek letter row. It has that kind of shape. Okay. okay. Now, in the group case, actually, because we are in a group, we can say something more remarkable. We can say that actually the first repetition has to cycle back to the identity element. So in a group, the only type of picture you can have is this type of picture, where the cycling goes back all the way to the identity. Okay. Uh, rather, th so you cannot have this type of picture where the cycling sort of cycles back to some point, which is not the identity element. Because if you had two powers are equal, remember that was that was our uh, original, thing, right? Yeah. If you had two powers equal, you could multiply by x to the minus l, and therefore get that the identity equals x to the k minus l. So if you did have any repetition anywhere, you could sort of move the repetition back to the identity, which means if you have repetition, it has to be a cycle. And and the part which confused you actually, it's sort of maybe clearer here. Yeah, because you have to times in this case, an x minus 1 to get back to e. Yeah, now is it clearer, that thing? Well, in the picture it is. It's clearer? Yeah, uh, this type of thing is, is called, uh, the, uh, the groups which are which are completely of this type, where there's a single element, where they're all powers of a single element, are called cyclic groups. We'll see this in detail later. Uh, but they have a very nice, nice behavior. Okay, one last thing I want to, I want to mention here is, is uh, the question of, what happens if you don't have a group? So, move it this way. So, if you don't have a group, you can have this row shape. Okay? You can or you can't? You can. Oh. It's possible. So, if you have a monoid and not a group. So, let me give you one quick example. Uh, so, let's say you have this thing. So, uh, you have this set 0, 1, 2. Okay? And your operation is defined as A star B is min of 2, comma, a plus b. Okay, so it's sort of you add the numbers. If the sum is uh, is less than or equal to 2, it's just the sum. If the sum is bigger than 2, then you just take 2. Okay, this is an associative operation. It's commutative, associative. It has an identity element. What's the identity element for this operation? Identity? Yeah. What's... Oh no, what's the thing such that if you uh, if you apply it to anything else, it remains that other thing? One. Well, there's only one left that I haven't guessed. Zero. No, what should it be? I mean, I didn't say which of your guesses is correct. <laughs> so, so if you just had addition, then what would the identity be for addition? Zero. Zero. Okay. Now you're doing main two comma a plus b, but the uh, same idea works. Zero is still the identity, right? Mm -hmm. Zero plus anything is just that thing. And min of two comma anything is just that thing. Okay, so the identity is zero. Now, if I take x as one and I do this type of picture, what what picture do I get? Start at zero, the identity. Then I multiply by x. That's like zero star one. What's zero star one? One. Mm -hmm. What's one star one? One star two. one is two. Mm -hmm. What's two star one? Two. So it cycles just on this one, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it is this row type shape. It doesn't cycle back to the identity, is what I'm saying. Oh. It's cycling back, but to, to a point other than the identity, right? So it's this row shape, but it's not a cyclic shape. 
Okay, so that's what I was saying. So, so okay, so in in a in the so we we saw for why finiteness is important. We had the in example of naturals and integers. We saw why non-empty is important because other empty set doesn't contain the identity element. Uh, we saw why the group structure is important because if you don't have a group structure, you cannot do that sort of move things down. So, uh, so so the identity element may get missing. Okay.